I am just delighted to welcome an extraordinary, extraordinary person with unique and just different qualities. <laughs> Sorry. Her name is Kate Bornstein. And as she was just telling me over 40, 45 years ago, Kate sat opposite me holding the holding the cans on the Apollo. She was she was highly respected Lieutenant Al Bonstein. Huh. And Kate did the most incredible thing. Now, many people go, Kate, what, 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 why did you join Scientology? What did you, what happened? What? Kate knew that she was not a man. She knew it from the four years old. And yet she joined the most homophobic, transphobic, but they got her because they said, you have no gender as a spirit. You have no gender. <gasps> that was a real carrot dangling. And so Kate devoted her next 12 years to the cult. However, that's just one small fraction part of her life. She's an act, she's done. At 70 years old, she was on Broadway in New York. She participated in Blacklist with James Spader. She was on with Kate, Caitlin Jenner. She, she's done a huge, endless amount of TV shows. If you go to YouTube no. and put in Kate Bornstein, you'll see some of the interviews she did. So she she's on the map, but her dearest, biggest love <laughs> is helping what she calls outlaws, queers, the, the fringe of society that cultural society frowns on because they are fluid in gender. Now, I'm not going to talk. I want Kate to do all the talking. I've given you, she's an actress. Oh, oh, I'm going to display her books. They're all available on Amazon. This is a, an example of a Kate Bornstein book, A Queer <laughs> and Pleasant Danger. I, I, uh, she wrote a book on... She, Kate found out that many teenagers kill themselves over their confusion on sex. So she wrote a book called 101 Ways. <laughs> Uh, I know my videographer will display the Amazon um, it's, title. It's uh -huh. called Hello Cruel World. Hello, it's cruel, called Hello world. cruel World. And the subtitle is 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Teens, Freaks, and Other Outlaws. Brilliant title. Brilliant title. Uh, Hello Cruel World. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so. I will start off by, you went to Brown University. <laughs> I, I, I went to Brown University in the 60s. Brown University in the 60s, uh, yes, it was Ivy League, but it was the bottom of the barrel Ivy League. We were all drunk and everyone was drunk there it was just drunken party after drunken party i found my way into some acting classes there was no acting major there um but that's when i fell in love with theater at brown at brown university where were you mentally on the range and spectrum of male and female Oh, gee whiz, um, pretty much the way most Scientologists were. I was homophobic and transphobic. I thought it was a oh. freaky thing. I thought it was a perversion. Uh, oh. I wished I was dead. Uh, you know, it was not, it was not a pleasant time. No, uh, no not, not a happy time at all. But Brown University, the way you describe it was more like 
Hmm. More like Berkeley is today, no? It was wild and no, permissive, just no? Just the way I described it, no, a lot hmm. of drunks. I see. <laughs> okay. It. And then, uh, well, until we discovered marijuana, and then it was a lot of, you know, potheads. And then, and that was that. <laughs> yeah. So then you got lured into the cult. Or is it after Brown? All right. At around that All right. time? Lured, lured is a dramatic term. I mean, I, I, I stepped forward. Um, okay. I responded to stuff the way anybody who gets into Scientology responds to stuff. Uh, they're good at it. They find you ruin. Yes. And they tell, they tell you uh, they can fix it. And I went, all right. They claim that you're not a body. You're not your mind. You're an immortal being. Uh, and as an immortal being, you have no gender. And I thought, fuck, that makes sense. That makes a great deal of sense. Um, unfortunately, their founder, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, was born the same year as my father and Ronald Reagan, and they were all as homophobic as one another. Yes. For all ex-Scientologists or Scientology watchers, please read A Queer and Pleasant Danger. Kate Bornstein worked directly for Hubbard. She did the most... Can you describe that mission you did, Kate? That's quite a, something. A uh, mission? The garrison mission to follow? No, no, no. The mission smuggling cash. Oh, gee. That's when I was at Tours Ridge. And... Um... I think it was, let's see, where was I going? Columbia. And they paid me in cash. And I just stuffed it into my pants. I stuffed it into my jacket, into my luggage. And it was well over ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in U.S. currency that I brought in illegally. In 1970s currency? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you were so dedicated at the time. As were we all. We were. You know, it was, we believed. We, we, believe, we really believed we were um, clearing the planet, that we were saving Earth uh, from certain destruction. Right. And, and, and it, it made us feel good to do yeah. that. Um, some of the best times of my life was when I was on the deck force and I oh. could just be out in the sun, uh, tarring decks or yeah. chipping paint. Yeah. And it was just terrific. Uh, it's when I got into all the administrative stuff and all that it start, and the stress started piling up uh, for statistics that were based on nonsense hmm. you started to see the nonsensical of it and you huh well i don't know it must be me it must be me i don't understand it it must be me uh that it doesn't quite work on that's that's the problem it must be me hmm. and uh I, I sat in that for a long time hmm. you were very trusted and very valued because you were you were just overnight awarded warrant officer. <laughs> you skipped midshipman and all the PO1, PO2. And then you were made first mate. For those that don't know the nautical terms that Scientology ripped off from the Navy, first mate is only one level below captain. And which means, may I no? please? Yes, sure. Jewish closet case. Nothing to do with the ship. I mean, I knew stage carpentry, you know, I could tie a few knots because I did my ABC, able bodied seaman course. Yeah. But that was it. Um, I remember I was responsible for the lifeboats. It was one of the things I was responsible for. And do you remember like lowering them down into yeah. the water? And yeah. here's the water and here's the lifeboat. And the damn things kept going underwater. 
<laughs> they wouldn't float. Except L. Ron Hubbard's, his, his was maintained. And yeah. would float. So, I, can you just explain, uh, I know how paranoid and homophobic Scientology can be. It's a kind of a status thing. We are the most ethical group on the planet, they chant, that is one of their mottos. Can you explain how they came to find out that you were uncomfortable being male? Can you, did you give it up in confession? How did, how did this suddenly have Scientology penalize you to only eating scraps of food after everyone had eaten, that kind of thing? How did, how did, okay, go that, ahead. That, that didn't quite happen. Okay. Um, first off, I'm confused to this day if Phaetons aren't male Phaetons and female Phaetons, and everybody who's been in Scientology and who's gotten auditing has had male lifetimes and female lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, what's the big deal about homosexuality? You go, mm -hmm. Okay, you're with a body now. Why does it have to fuck quote unquote opposite sex? Mm -hmm. it, it, that's crazy. Nothing else in Scientology made sense, but that made sense. You stayed in it 12 years? Yeah. My first couple of years were terrific because I was on a big boat, big ship. I ended up being promoted to first mate. Right after the captain of the ship, I was responsible for the whole fucking boat. So you're a pretty high-ranking officer. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. How did your time in Scientology come to an end? It was still homophobic and transphobic. That language wasn't used, but that's what it was. Do they try and change you? Yes. So they don't just kick you out, but they'll try and fix you if you're willing? You have to be willing. Mm -hmm. And they offered me a choice. And the way they described it, as I would be sleeping on the garage floor outside, I couldn't eat any food in the dining room. I had to wait till everybody else had eaten, then I could eat the scraps they left over. It was either that or I could be excommunicated forever. Excommunicate me. That was traumatic. Right. So what do you, where do you go when you have nothing left? No Scientologist in good standing was allowed to talk with me, which included my nine-year-old daughter. Is her mother a member? Oh, yeah. So They're you both. lost your family? I lost my family, I lost my friends. And factor in all this time I was hating myself for being trans and trying to cure myself of that. Why does someone who lands in a male body have to continue it being male? and vice versa. And that I've, to this day, I haven't figured out. So someone in Scientology who's homophobic, that doesn't make sense to me. To me, if you're homophobic and in Scientology, you don't really believe in spiritual beings. You're a spiritual being. It doesn't matter who you fuck. <laughs> That's where it comes down to. Um, nobody punished me for being a pervert. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I gave it up in, in session after session after session. It was my once handled. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was kept a total, total secret until I, uh, until I blew. And I only blew after I found out that all the money I was making in Europe was going directly into the old man's bank accounts in Switzerland. Mm. I found that out. I said, no, that's it. He's a liar. And I left. And at that point, that's when they announced it at Mustard People. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Al Bornstein likes to wear women's underwear. Mm. Mm. So, so kind of goofy. In uh, where? In what city did you blow? Clearwater, Florida. Oh, in Clearwater. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they brought me in. I, I, I had discovered that there was a big wad of cash in the Swiss bank under the name of L. Ron Hubbard. And I thought it was a setup. I thought someone was setting up the old man because that would never happen. And I called and I said, I, I got to come in. I got to report this. And the financial police greeted me on the, on the, you know, on the tarmac in, in Clearwater mm -hmm. and escorted me to the basement of the, of the Fort Harrison. Ooh. And I understand it's called a gangbang sec check. It yeah. was, wasn't called that then, but it sure felt like it. And um, I thought all this upset. You're telling me that that money does belong to L. Ron Hubbard. Mm. No, no. And then they offered me uh, RPF or excommunication. Mm. And I chose excommunication. Mm. Mm. Did you say, go ahead and declare me? How did you, how did you voice you, your option? I said, you go ahead and excommunicate. Hmm. Hmm. and they seemed satisfied with that and hmm. I found out like a month later that all those financial police guys the, when the financial police was disbanded and they were all sent to the RPF but by that time it was way too late hmm. I, I, I'd gotten a taste of freedom Mm. A, a taste of being able to make my own decisions mm. about not having to worry about Thursday at two o'clock, not having to figure out a way to cheat on my stats so that mm. I could have something besides rice and beans for dinner. Mm. It was a creepy way of living in that organization. Kate, did they threaten that you would never see your daughter again? You had a nine-year-old daughter at that time, Jessica. We'll talk a little more about Jessica. Did they use any leverage of your daughter at this show? I bet you had someone called Don Larson in the, in the uh, international finance dictator police. <laughs> anyway. Did they did they mention Jessica at all to you? No, they didn't have to. I knew exactly what was going to happen mm -hmm. when I said excommunicate me. Um, I tried to, I, I knew I wanted to say goodbye to her, but I knew that if I did and she was in contact with me at all, they had an RPF designed for children. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they did. And I didn't want to risk putting her there. So she was living with her mother, Molly, Molly Baxter. I know Molly. <laughs> and uh, Molly's husband, Randy. They're still happily married. And I knew that they loved her. And I knew that they would give her as good a home as possible in that organization. What I didn't know was how... How indoctrinated someone would become growing up in there. Uh, it's the reason I finally wrote a memoir, Queer and Pleasant Danger. It's, it's a letter to Jessica to say, here, this is what happened to your dad. This is why I didn't pull any punches. And um, I doubt she'll choose to read it. I doubt that her children will choose to read it, but maybe one of her grandchildren will one day. Mm. And that would be swell. Mm. I'm, I, I walk in your shoes. I lost my child because of the cold. Oh, so I know the pain and I know. Now, Kate, just to linger a little bit more on your daughter, Jessica, a, a very famous trans person befriended you, befriended you to this day, Caitlin Chenna. And you were, were you in season one? I know you were in season two. Were you in season one of I Am Kate? 
I was in one of the last episodes of season one, and because of that, they 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 kept me on for season two. Yeah, wonderful. And at one time when we were in L.A. together, um, I got the silly idea. I found out where Jessica was, and she was something Division Six secretary at. L.A. Org when they were staffing it with Sea Org members, and I figured, oh my God, I'm in L.A. I just found out Jessica's in L.A. And I asked uh, Caitlyn Jenner, would she help me go see? Now, Caitlyn, and back when she was Bruce, was a champion. She's an Olympic champion. And when you look at that word champion, that's exactly what she was. She, she chose to champion me mm. and accompany me mm. as we went into Big Blue together and asked for Jessica. And the jaws dropped when the two of us walked in. Mm. And she said, oh, there, my name is Caitlin Jenner. And this is my friend Kate. Uh, we're here to see Jessica Baxter. Mm. And no, nah, they kept us waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally said, no, she's not here. No. They kept you waiting. Uh, there was no recognition of Caitlyn Jenner at all, right? <laughs> no. no. The CEO they, already lives in a bubble, the staff. Yeah. And did they realize that you were the father of Jessica? They must have. Mm. Mm. Anyway, Jessica is now like 48 years old, 40, whatever, and she is now the commanding officer of Scientology in the continent of Africa. Yeah. That's, that's the cost of Scientology. You lose your children. The indoctrination goes deep, especially when they've been raised and know nothing else. Nothing else. Mm. 